Uh, hello, Natalia. Good hey. morning, Brazil. Good night in Rocha. I think we are alive now. How are you? Yes, we, we are. are yes, I think we start. We are alive. Okay. Uh, our live started. So thank you very much for you accepting my invitation uh, to come here in my channel, Paleobot Videos, Paleobot and Paleonology for Everybody. I think you have good things uh, to talk to us here in Brazil about macroalgas and precambrian things. So I am very happy with you. I think it's some problem in... Okay. Okay, I think some problem... Uh, here uh people are you seeing us uh now i uh, i see i think I yes see. yes right. yes yes so let me let me say some words in portuguese okay and after yes, sure. a bom pessoal eu tô muito feliz aqui de receber é a doutora Natália Bicova, da Rússia, né? É um privilégio para mim receber uma, uma pessoa de fora tão qualificada, né? Para falar um pouquinho para a gente sobre macroalgas, sobre a evolução de características de macroalgas durante o pré-cambriano. Então, para mim, é uma, é uma honra recebê-la, uma jovem cientista. Eu espero que vocês aproveitem, né? É, aqui no meu canal eu estou procurando trazer vários temas sobre paleobotânica, sobre palinologia, e estou procurando fazer uma integração internacional. Né? Estamos num mundo globalizado, então o paleobot se tornando globalizado também. Né? É, eu vou, falar, vou voltar agora para o inglês para dizer um pouquinho sobre o currículo da Natália, e depois eu volto para o português para falar de novo sobre o currículo dela. Mas já quero dizer aqui que a palestra vai ser em inglês, tá? Então, vamos lá. Uh, I will talk about your curriculum, Natália, now. Natália has bacharel degree in geology, she is geologist, Uh, she did her bachelor degree in geology, geophysics department in Novo State University in Russia. Uh, she did a master degree in the same university in geology and geophysics department in Novo State University in Russia. And she did a PhD in Department of Geoscience, Virginia Tech, in United States. And she was supervised in PhD for a Xiao. Xiao is very important, is very important uh, paleontologist. Very important, and he supervised uh, her. Uh, and uh, in Rocha, her supervisor was Dimitri Grazan Duncan uh, in graduation and master's degree. She will explain better uh, her curriculum, her experience, ok? Now in Portuguese. Então, gente, ela, ela se formou, ela é geóloga, se formou na Rússia, é, na Universidade de Novo Sibirsk, tá? é uma universidade estadual, parece. O mestrado dela ela fez nessa mesma universidade e o doutorado dela ela fez no Departamento de Geossciências da Universidade de Virginia Tech com o Xiao, né? que é um importantíssimo é, paleontólogo. Tá? E agora ela vai dar mais detalhes para vocês das experiências dela, da formação dela, tá? So, uh, Natália, you can uh, 
ten, é, say more about your experience. Oh, one minute, one minute, I forget. Nowadays, she sent you research at the Trofimuk Institute of Petroleum Geology and Geophysics. Geophysics. In Novosibirsk, Russia. Russia. E public bilingual guide Russian and English at the Novosibirsk State University Research and Education Center. Evolution of the Earth. Okay, so she will explain more. Her English is better than my English. Uh, as I told you before, sorry for my terrible English. She will explain more, okay? You can talk more about you. Yeah, Please. sure. Thank you for the invitation, first of all. I'm really pleased to be here and talk today about my research. And uh, as you said already, I did my uh, bachelor and my master's degrees in Novosibirsk where I was born. And Novosibirsk, it's uh, in the middle, pretty much in the middle of Russia. So it's in Siberian part of Russia. So even though here it's 8 p.m. In, in Moscow now, it's just 4 p.m. So <laughs> Russia is pretty big. and. Uh, I did my bachelor and master degree mostly on, uh, as well as PhD in Virginia Tech, uh, mostly focusing on Ediacaran period. Uh, it's from 635 to 500, 4, 540 million years ago. And uh, I was studying the enigmatic Ediacaran biota and uh, microalga from that period. But also the macro, uh, during my PhD, I got interested in uh, microalga also, not only during the Ediacaran, but before that and in Phanerozoic. And it's pretty much what I'm going to talk about today. And as well, after I returned back after my PhD, uh, now I also lead in the excursions, uh, the tours in the museum uh, in Novosibirsk State University uh, in the Russian and English languages. So any can come and enjoy our newly opened museum. I think, I think that that's all about me. And uh, can we start? Should we start? Yes, uh, Lisa, Natalia, after your presentation, I will return and you will answer some questions, okay? People yeah, sure. will ask you some things, okay? Yeah. So let me put here the screen. Put your screen to share, yes. Can you, okay. can you see it? Okay. Yes, I can see. And I will put in all the screen now. One minute. Okay. Yes, so we, you, you can start. Okay, great. So uh, today uh, we are going to talk about the evolutionary patterns of Proterozoic and some Paleozoic microalga. I put some Paleozoic microalga because we are not going to talk about who Paleozoic, but only about the uh, early Paleozoic, which includes Cambrian, Ordovician, and Silurian time. And uh, most of my talk is going to be uh, based on the recently published paper in Precambrian Research. It's still preprint, as a matter of fact. And uh, of course, I want to say thank you to all my co-authors, because without them, I would not be able to do all that work uh, by myself. And it's, of course, Steven Luduka, uh, Chin Yi from China, uh, Vasily Marusin and Dmitry Grzdankin from Novosibirsk, uh, and of course, uh, Shuhai Shao, uh, my advisor. Uh, so, uh, what do we know about macroalgae and why, why we as a paleontologist are even interested in studying uh, macroalgae in, in, in the past? So, if you look at the modern macroalgal ecosystems, and here you see the uh, beautiful picture of the kelp forest somewhere around the Cape Town area where they uh, really abundant. And even back in time, uh, almost uh, 150 years ago, uh, Charles Darwin, when he was making his uh, trip, uh, he said that he only can compare this great aquatic forest of the southern hemisphere with the terrestrial ones in the intertropical regions. Yet, if in any country a forest was destroyed, 
I do not believe nearly so many species of animals would perish as would hear from the destruction of the kelp. So it's pretty much shows us how important the microalgar are and how Charles Darwin also thought that they're important because they're not only produce oxygen and enrich the water with the oxygen they also create uh, niches for other animals and for other organisms uh, they basically makes make home and they also uh, of course the source of food uh, for a lot of organisms who also live in the ocean so if we look at the proterozoic uh, time uh, there are a lot of things which were happening there uh, so we start with uh, Paleoproterozoic, which we are going to talk about today a little bit. Uh, and basically it starts with the uh, increase uh, of the oxygen uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, it's, uh, there are some perturbations, but then we go into Mesoproterozoic, which uh, usually uh, called boring billion because for a long time we used to think that there is nothing happening there. You can see that the carbonate carbon isotope curve is pretty stable there and more or less the oxygen is stable there even though now there are evidence that it was some whiffs of the oxygen happening during that time but we still uh, of course, do not have a whole picture because the deeper in time we go, the more complicated it for us as a paleontologist and geologist uh, to reconstruct the whole ecosystem. And then we come to the Neoproterozoic. It's around, uh, it's from one a billion years ago to 540 million years ago. And here, Antonian, uh, which is the first period of Neoproterozoic, we start to see the crown group of eukaryotes, which appears during that time. Uh, and then uh, it follows by cryogenium. Uh, and it's basically, in a way, freezing millions. It's time when it was a lot of uh, glaciations uh, on the Earth. And it's the time of the so-called snowball theory, uh, snowball Earth, when uh, scientists think that the whole uh, earth was covered by the glaciations and then we go to the ediacaran where we start to see the micro uh bilaterians. we start to see animal biomineralizations the first trace fossils appear here and uh, after that of course we go to the cambrian to the cambrian explosion to the appearance of a lot of uh, animals uh in the geologic record so that's pretty much the time scale which we're going to work on from 250 to the early Paleozoic for uh, 20 or something like that. So uh, if we look at the diacaran biosphere, which as I mentioned in the before the talk, uh, I was focusing mostly during my uh, uh, degrees. Uh, Ediacaran biosphere is a very common reconstruction of it, of that enigmatic uh, organism which were pretty much found in each continent by now. And you can see those really beautiful, big organisms. Some of them could be animals, uh, some of them we have no idea what they are. For example, this is uh, so called Inaria or Aspidel, which is a holdfast of unknown organisms. Here we have uh, Tribrachidium, uh, which is also, there, there is nothing like that in the uh, modern organisms. But most of the time when scientists uh, study the spirit of time, of course, they focus on those colorful parts uh, of the ecosystem. But what's going to happen if we are going to take them out? We're going to take them out in this particular reconstruction. We pretty much left only with microbial mats, which were covering most of the uh, sea floor during that time and prior that time. Uh, but what is missing, the missing part, of course, is microalga. For some reason, uh, in the most reconstructions, they are not present. And it's interesting because if we look at the evolution of macroalga, they appear much before the animals or the first backward bilaterians occur in the geologic record. So the first macroalga uh, or possible macroalga 
uh, appears some, uh, somewhat 1.8 uh, billion years ago. And then we have the evidence of the red alga uh, around 1.2 and then green alga around 1 billion year ago. And the animals only happened during the uh, like last part of the Ediacaran. So the uh, microalga, the, uh, the evolution history is much longer than uh, of the animals, which uh, most of the time the researchers concentrated in uh, Ediacaran and early Paleozoic. In Paleozoic, it's uh, in early Paleozoic, it's really uh, complicated because as soon as we start to see uh, all the like fancy, like fancy animals like trilobites and bryozoans and all of that, uh, people even do not report that they find any of macroalga. And of course, it complicates uh, the reconstruction of the whole biosphere for those periods of time. So what have been done uh, before uh, in terms of macroalga? So uh, Xiao, my advisor, and uh, he, one of his previous students in Don back in 2006, uh, they tried to see uh, the uh, morphological evolution of uh, the macroalga through time. Uh, they uh, compiled a really nice uh, paleo, uh, paleo base uh, of macroalga, which were known at that time. It's nearly 15 years ago, uh, from Paleoproterozoic to Ediacaran. But at that time, uh, they first, they haven't had anything for Cryogenian. And the uh, amount of Ediacaran uh, macroalga, which uh, happened to be in the database, was uh, uh, relatively small. It was only 90 sam 91 sample. And uh, uh, mostly, it's included the uh, samples from Miohe member uh, of the Oshanto Formation uh, in China. Uh, and here, uh, I sorry, I, I didn't put it that uh, in the beginning. So here, basically, uh, this is the NMDS analysis, and each point here represented one of the uh, samples in the database, and it's. Uh, uh, those uh, shades basically show how big or small the morphous space is. So you can see that here in uh, Paleoproterozoic, there is only three points. It's a really small morphous space uh, occupation. And then in the early Neoproterozoic, uh, in Mesoproterozoic, it's got bigger and bigger in uh, early Neoproterozoic, uh, it was Tonian and then Ediacaran. Uh, recently also, uh, Steve Loduca and uh, co-authors, I also was included in that study. Uh, we also done the uh, uh, pretty much singular study, but for the early Paleozoic macroalga, specifically for Cambrian or Division and Silurian. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, because Stephen, he, he is mostly concentrated on the Paleozoic macroalgar, that uh, research, uh, that study included only uh, early Paleozoic, and we included Ediacaran just for comparison, but it didn't include, of course, the uh, later uh, macroalgar. And... Uh, this research actually done uh, a really good job in terms of describing macroalga from uh, Precambrian and in the early Paleozoic with the same uh, words, with the same uh, morphologies, because uh, the terminology and the descriptions of the macroalga in Proterozoic and in the Phanerozoic, is, uh, they quite differ. And of course, it was a lot of uh, uh, things put into compiling, trying to make it, uh, trying to use the same terminology for the uh, Proterozoic and the Phanerozoic macroalga. 
And also uh, in the Oladuka et al. 2017, uh, we use the functional form group uh, analysis. I'm going to explain it a little bit later. Uh, but again, here we use it only for the uh, Phanerozoic part, uh, only for Cambrian or Division and Silurian. And it, uh, it did a really good job uh, dis, uh, discriminating the Cambrian fauna from the Ordovician and Silurian fauna. So you can see that the composition of uh, the microalgae was quite different in terms of uh, morphological groups. Uh, but of course, that was just the parts of the uh, here Proterozoic and here Phanerozoic microalgae. So what we were trying to do with our research, it's basically, first of all, filling the gap of cryogenian because since 2006, uh, the microalgae were found in cryogenian. For now, it's the only one place in the world. It's Nanto formation from South China. So we included those data. We also would, uh, wanted to improve data for the ediacaran interval because in the previous studies of Xiao and Don, they included only or mostly uh, the uh, microalga from the ocean to formation, but microalga uh, are known from a lot of places uh, during the ediacaran time. And we also wanted to see if there are any uh, correlation with animal evolution because there are some uh, correlate. There, there is a correlate correlation uh, of microalga with animals in our division period, and uh, because, as I mentioned again uh, before, that I was uh, mostly uh, interested in ediacaran, uh, we also wanted to see if there are any changes in ediacaran microalga because ediacaran is right before uh, pretty much the Cambrian explosion happened. And it's really important and interesting to see what was happening there. So we wanted to see are there are any differences between Ediacar and Macrel sandwiches uh, and uh, how those differences, if uh, there are any, correspond to the those beautiful ediacar like biota, that enigmatic one which we're studying for a long time. So in terms of material, uh, we again compiled the uh, Big database, of course, we used uh, the Xiao and Don 2006 and then expanded on it. Uh, now we have uh, almost three times more occurrences of microalga, and they uh, include microalga from Paleoproterozoic to early Paleozoic. Uh, and uh, a little bit more than 900 samples of those occurrences are from Ediacaran. As you remember on the previous slide, uh, in the previous database, it was only 90 sample, 91 sample from the Ediacaran period. Uh, we use 30 morphological characters, and here I just show you the uh, different uh, type of microalga which we had. Uh, they are mostly from Ediacaran and some Paleozoic ones, and here the Cryogenian one. And you can see that here there is a tubular form, here is the ribbon, here is the spherical form. So all the, here, here there are different type of uh, branching forms and lingual form. So all those morphologies were included in our database. Uh, and in terms of material, we used uh, museum collections uh, material uh, to which we can uh, reach. For example, uh, these samples, they're from Caddish Pit Formation, which is uh, that assemblage uh, is not uh, described yet. But because I was working on it and I have access to it, I was able to include it in our uh, study. Uh, and of course, we also use the published papers, book and monographs. And again, uh, one of the unique thing of our uh, study is that uh, even though we did use the published uh, material, but for a lot of uh, material from Ediacaran, Cryogenian, and uh, early Paleozoic, uh, most of those uh, occurrences which are in our database, uh, some of the uh, co-authors of that paper uh, actually saw in person. And of course, as a geologist, we know that it's always better to see material by uh, yourself. And in terms of methods, I 
briefly touched on that, we use the NMDS analysis, which is non-metric multidimensional scaling. And basically what it does, it uses the um, discontinuous variables, uh, its uh, presence and absence data. And basically uh, after that, it puts all the uh, all the uh, samples in the database to, like in this case, uh, 2D uh, picture in which each point is representing one of the samples from uh, the database. Uh, we also use the functional form groups, which I mentioned before. And what it does, basically, it's uh, this approach is really uh, widely used in the modern ecological studies. Uh, and it's used for characterizing the assemblages of microalga based on their morphologies. So uh, based on the morphologies which you can see in the modern ecosystems, uh, you can predict uh, in which environments uh, those uh, microalga live. And of course, if you have the uh, uh, the opposite is also true. If you have the certain number, the certain parameters of your environment, uh, like disturbance potential or productivity potential, you can predict what kind of microalga are going to live there. And it doesn't work on the uh, species level. So you cannot predict what kind of species are going to live in each part uh, of your ecosystem, but you can predict the morphology which are going to appear there. And of course, for the modern studies, sometimes it's uh, not appropriate, but for what we were trying to do to see are there are any changes in morphologies through time in microalga? That was the ideal method which we were trying to apply for our data. And of course, while we were doing all of that, we also uh, uh, collected the metric data. We used the maximum dim uh, the maximum dimension of microalga. Uh, we just measured that, and the surface area volume ratio, which we try to estimate based on the measurements which we had for each of the occurrences in our database. So what we've got from all that uh, data which we collected. So if we look uh, at the first part, so we were trying to see are there are any trends for macroalga from Paleoproterozoic to Silurian. And for that, we see the overall expansion of the morphospace occupation. And how you can see it, if you look at the Paleoproterozoic, you see the really small space, uh, those uh, black dots which con uh, connected to each other. Uh, this is the morphospace of the Paleoproterozoic macroalga. And it basically tells you that it was not much variety of morphologies during that time. Uh, and they were a uh, pretty small uh, variety. Then we go to Mesoproterozoic, and you can see that this space is uh, getting bigger, and then in Tonian, it gets bigger and bigger until the Ediacaran, pretty much. And Ediacaran, it's one of the biggest morphospace occupation of macroalga, at least uh, based on the uh, database which we have for now and then when we go to uh, Phanerozoic to Cambrian non derivation Silurian basically that morphous phase just to start to uh, goes away from the central part of uh, the Proterozoic where it appears for the first time and basically all of those changes are based on the appearance of such uh, characters, it's cortex and verticals in the macroalga, and all of that happened in Phanerozoic, and we do not see it uh, in uh, Precambrian, and it's why the morphospace start to move uh, inside of that chart. Uh, we also uh, let, uh, wait a second. We also can see that uh, for the each of the periods, uh, periods of time, so Paleoproterozoic and so on, here we have the N number, and it's basically 
shows you the amount of samples in that uh, period of time. And you can see that uh, in Paleoproterozoic, for example, it's 21. In Cryogenian, it's almost 500. In Ediacaran, it's 936. And like in order division, it's just 38. And of course, based on that uh, changes, uh, that morphous space uh, can be different because we have a different amount of samples inside of that. So in order to uh, overcome that statistical problem, uh, we use the uh, variance. So variance basically, uh, it, uh, it includes itself that there is a different sample size for each of the period and it neglects that amount and it shows the real differences between all of those different periods of time. So here, the stars, I have three stars, the stars shows the statistically significant difference in the morphous space occupation between two uh, periods of time which stays next to each other and as you can see there is a two uh stepwise uh expansions one of them happened in tonian sorry i lived it as cryogenian before because before it was in cryogenian but in reality it's in tonian uh the first uh stepwise uh, expansion from mesoproterozoic to tonian and then the second one happening from cambrian to ordovician in those two uh intervals there is a statistically significant increase in the morphospace occupation and there is a third star here uh, between ediacaran and cambrian and statistically there is a decrease between Ediacaran and Cambrian. Uh, the reason for that is uh, unclear for now because uh, first of all, in Ediacaran, there are a lot of uh, uh, microalgae. Well, there are a lot of samples which we uh, refer as microalgae, but in reality, there are no any uh, singular organisms later on or like microalgae later on so they may not be microalgae per se so maybe that's a change uh statistically significant change in morphologies uh is because some of the uh morphologies are actually not microalgae but maybe uh there are some other reasons which i'm going to talk about later so now we have Two increases in Tonian and or division. And of course, it's interesting what could be responsible uh, for those changes. Uh, so uh, for Tonian, for example, why we have that uh, morphospace occupation uh, jump from mesoproterozoic to Tonian, most probably it's because of the uh, branch forms, branch microalgae in Tonian. As a matter of fact, Tonian is the first period uh, of time in the Earth history when the first branch microalgae appear. And as you can see, those uh, findings were uh, done recently, one of them, and there are only two localities for now where they found. Uh, one of them is uh, from China, it's uh, from Nanfan Formation, and it's called Protocladus Antiquus, uh, which was published in this year by my colleague uh, Qin Tang. Uh, and you can see that clear branching in the macroalga here. And the second occurrence is uh, also Protocladus, in this case, Major, and some unnamed forms. Uh, from the Hastach uh, and Kuladai formations of Siberia. So most probably that jump from Mesoproterozoic to Tonian in the morphospace occupation is because in Tonian we start to see those branch for, uh, forms which uh, were not known before and it's statistically significant change. Uh, if we look at uh, the studies of biomarkers for that time, of, uh, then uh, you can see that uh, they also pretty much agree with the jump in Tonian. 
So if uh, here in the Paleoproterozoic and Mesoproterozoic, we have only tubular and uh, spherical macroalgae. And also if you look at the uh, uh, at the biomarker data, you can see that here that's mostly the biomarkers of bacteria and no any strains, which usually eukaryotes produce. And when we go to Tonian, it's not from the beginning as the paleontological data says us, but uh, from the later parts of uh, Tonian period, we start to see the rays of some of the strains and uh, it's uh, currently, uh, these data shows us that at that time, most probably red, red algae were appearing in the ecosystems. And we should remember that biomarkers analyzing the rock and they see what kind of biomolecules are preserved there. And of course, at the beginning of Tonian, when we start to see those branch forms, because non-fan formation is around uh, uh, approximately 1 billion years ago, uh, bi billion years old, uh, of course, if we have uh, just uh, a small portion of uh, microalga there and they are not ecologically significant, they are not taking the, a lot of uh, like biomass, in the ecosystem, of course, uh, it's really hard for them to be preserved and uh, later on be analyzed and be shown in the biomarkers. But by the late 20s, we can see that the strains of uh, the strains start to appear, and these probably tell us that by the late 20s, the macroalgae were already a big uh, part of the ecosystem. And uh, if we look further uh, at the biomarkers as uh, shown uh, here in the Baroxid Hall paper in 2017, uh, that they appear in Tonian, like the first terrains, and then uh, by the Creogenian, and here, of course, the data are from non-fan formation here, or uh, Nento formation, sorry here uh, appears the rise of alga, the rise uh, to the ecological significance of macroalga uh, for the ecosystem. And so if we look at the functional form groups uh, results again, uh, we can see here that uh, in the Paleoproterozoic and Mesoproterozoic, we have mostly uh, uh, simple forms, uh, the spherical ones and the tube forms and uh, ribbon-like forms. And then in Tonian, for the first time, we start to see those branch forms and they get in a more and more significant uh, part of the uh, of the ecosystem through time. And uh, in Ordovician, it's the second jump. In the morphous occupation, you can see that most uh, of the macroalga are actually those complex branch forms, which in the modern environments usually happened uh, to be found in the more uh, turbulent environment, in the environment where there is some stress on the macroalga. And uh, here, uh, just one of the speculations, so we have that first appearance of the uh, branch forms in Tonian, and also during that time, uh, based on the um, molecular clock analysis, there is a uh, likely origin of animal happened during that time in Tonian. So, of course, the correlation doesn't mean causation, but it also can be because if we look later, uh, if we look later, uh, on the uh, Ordovician one, right? So the one which I told you before that in, in Ordovician, we start to have much more forms which have uh, uh, the branch forms. Uh, it's actually uh, really nicely uh, correlated with the uh, uh, Gobi event, the great uh, Ordovician biodiversification event during that time. Uh, we start to see a lot of 
uh, organisms, animals uh, evolved here, and uh, also uh, the most important, uh, we start to see the bioerosion in Ordovician. And it could be uh, the reason for that ev morphological evolution of macroalgae, because that may be a response of macroalgae to the uh, basically biological stress uh, from the organism which were eating them. And by producing all those branch uh, forests, uh, the, the crones, uh, they basically were trying to protect themselves from not being eaten. Uh, so if we look at the metric data uh, for macroalga from time, uh, basically overall there is uh, there is increase uh, of uh, the dimensions. Uh, here uh, A, B, it's the maximum dimension. So through time, the microalgae were getting bigger and bigger. And again, the stars here represent uh, the significant difference between the neighbor regions. And again, you can see that there is uh, basically the significant difference between Mesoproterozoic and Tonian, Tonian and Carrageenian, Carrageenian and Ediacaran. Uh, but again, there is no significant difference between uh, Cambrian and Ediacaran or Division of Cambrian. But again, in Silurian, when we start to see uh, the bioerosion marks uh, in the trace fossils, we start to see uh, the uh, bigger sizes in the macroalga. And uh, if we talk about the uh, surface volume ratio, uh, which uh, basically uh, somewhat uh, can, uh, tells us something about the uh, bioproduction, uh, again, there is the increase of the uh, surface to volume ratio through time. And again, uh, pretty much we have the same differences, except that in Cambrian, uh, there is a significant, statistically significant increase in surface volume ratio uh, between the macroalga from uh, Ediacaran. So uh, in terms of uh, what we can say about the trends in morphology and ecology of macroalga through time, there is the overall increasing trajectory in morphospace range, morphological disparity, functional form groups, maximum dimension, surface area volume, ra uh, volume ratio of macroalga from Proterozoic to early Paleozoic. Pretty much most of the parameters which we looked at, uh, there is increase from Proterozoic to Paleozoic. However, that increase is not uh, constant. We have uh, to uh, stepwise increase uh, in, in also in taxonomic diversity and morphospace range and disparity uh, during the Neoproterozoic, particularly Tonian, and uh, during the Ordovician time. And as uh, I showed you, there is no morphological Cambrian explosion of macroalga, as we can see based on the data uh, which we collected, and instead we see that the explosion for the macroalga was in Neoproterozoic, particularly in Tonia. So uh, that part was about the overall, uh, the overall um, trends uh, for the macroalga evolution. And now we are going to talk a little bit about the uh, morphological evolution of the Ediacaran macroalga. And here again, we have the same graphs with, uh, from an MDS where every point basically the uh, is, is a sample from one of the uh, assemblages. And here we have only uh, 11 assemblages. Uh, there are more of them, but unfortunately, we can include only assemblages which have uh, at least three groups. So we can uh, make a uh we can uh, uh make here a shape and if we don't have uh, th at least three different uh morphologies uh we cannot do that so for now we have only 11 assemblages from the ediacaran and as you can see there is no and uh i forgot to mention that they uh i try to put them into the age 
uh, age position. So the Shantosa de Pin is uh, presumably the oldest one. And then from the Sudapin here to Lantin, Perivala, Lanza do Shanto, and so on, we go into the younger and younger uh, assemblage. So the Luchako and Davis Klipuk uh, is going to be one of the youngest ones. So first of all, there are no any clear trends in the morphospace occupation. So you can see here, there is the relatively small uh, morphospace occupation. Here there is a big one. Here there is also a relatively small one. Uh, but um, even though there is no like one trajectory as we saw in from Proterozoic to Silurian, uh, we can say that the oldest assemblages, the one which are here shown in red, uh, tend to have a greater morphospace occupation. So, except of probably uh, Sudapina, maybe uh, Lanza Formation, uh, most of the other uh, localities uh, they show a pretty big morphospace occupation. Uh, and uh, the younger uh, localities, like uh, here it's Podolia, Yuchan, uh, Debes, and Luchapo, they have a relatively smaller uh, morphospace occupation. And here you probably uh, notice that the Kaddish pit has bo both colors, the green and the red one. And it's because uh, there are some problems with the uh, age estimation for the Kaddish pit formation. For a long time, uh, and based on the some of the uh, carbon isotope data, uh, the Kaddish pit formation uh, was estimated at 550, so it's right at the border of those like older assemblages. So that's why I put it uh, into the red one, into the red square. But also uh, recent data showed that based on the, for example, strontium uh, data, the Kaddish pit may be younger and it's maybe 545, then it would be in the green uh, colors, uh, in the uh, green assemblages. So. Uh, basically for uh, our paper, because for now we do not know for sure, uh, we need more analysis to be done in order to say for sure uh, where Kaddish pit, uh, what is the age of the Kaddish pit formation. So because of that, in our paper, we basically run all the analysis twice. In one, we included Kaddish pit to the older ones, and in another one, we included Kaddish pit assemblage to the younger ones. So if we look at the functional form groups uh, for the uh, adiacron assemblages, uh, we can see here that uh, those older ones uh, or early uh, early middle adiacron and white sea assemblages, we tend to, they tend to have more branch forms with the uh, exclusion of those uh, two uh, localities. It's the Perivalic, it's the Ural Mountains and the Lamsa Formation. It's the White Sea area of Russia. And the younger, uh, the younger assemblages, they tend to have a uh, small amount. So it's up to 10% uh, of the uh, uh, branch forms. But also you can see that here we have only eight for uh, Podolia and the three for Lucha Performation. This is the uh, uh, amount of the uh, different species uh, occurrences we have at those assemblages. So it means that we don't have a lot of data for those places. And also the data which we have mostly shows that those uh, assemblages consist mostly of the ribbon-like and tubular-like organisms. And uh, if you look at the metric data for the ediacaran period, uh, so the maximum dimension on the top, uh, again, we can see that uh, uh, depending on how we uh, put the Kaddish pit formation, if we put the uh, Kaddish pit formation into the uh, so-called white sea, uh, assemblage of the um, ediacara like biota, then uh, the, those older uh, assemblages going to have significantly uh, bigger, greater sizes uh, for the macroalga than the 
younger localities. And of course, if we put the Kaddish pit formation, which uh, shows one of the biggest uh, microalgae through all the periods which we studied in this uh, project, uh, then of course, uh, the uh, sizes of uh, microalgae uh, in the younger assemblages or nama assemblages getting bigger but overall we also see that something happening here because the sizes of macroalgae getting smaller even though before that they were kind of rising and if we look at the surface volume ratio of the diacrine assemblages there is no really any trends here and uh, we did um, analyze the changes in between different localities but uh, as I mentioned, with the, like we have problems with the age estimation of Kaddish pit, but also there are some other problems, age problems for other localities, which also may change the positions here. Uh, but overall, we can say that there is a change of surface volume ratio, which is uh, estimation of bioproductivity uh, between the early uh, middle ediacaran to the wide sea uh assemblage here and uh, sometimes in nama if we depend on where we put the caddish with locality and so uh in terms of changes in the diacaran macroalgal communities we can say that the older diacaran assemblages uh which is from 635 to 500 million years ago reached maximum of morphous phase uh range and the younger assemblages uh, exhibit a decline in morphous phase range, FFGs, and maximum height, which is the proxy for the can canopy height of the macroalgae. And so now, if we look at those major trends of microalgal evolution in Neoproterozoic and early Paleozoic, here we have um, all those different morpha groups and the times when they appeared. Uh, remember that I told you that the first branch forms appeared in Tonin and Sprudimach. We have that first morpha space change between Mesoproterozoic and Tonin. And uh, here we have different uh, localities uh, through all of those uh, periods of time. And uh, here, for example, you can see that, especially for Tonin, uh, we have a pretty uh, big estimation for the ages of the formations. Sometimes they are uh, like several uh, tens of millions of years. Uh, but anyway, if we uh, look even with those estimations, if we look at the um, alpha diversities, which are those colorful uh, bars, and the gamma diversity, so the diversity of the whole period of time, which is in gray, we can see that for Tonian, uh, the Tonian uh, diversity, alpha and gamma diversity, was higher than in Creogenian. Of course, this, uh, this trend may be the results of the fact that we only have one locality for Creogenian. It's Nancho formation in uh, uh, South China. Uh, but also it was time of the glaciations and we do not have that many rocks, uh, the sedimentary rocks preserved where we could look for the macroalgae. But of course, it's one of the places which we need to look uh, more precise uh, in other places uh, around the world to see maybe we can find more macroalgae at that period of time. And then when we go to Ediacaran, uh, Ediacaran shows the highest alpha and gamma diversity uh, in terms of macroalgae, as you can see here. And again, uh, even in the alpha diversity, we have that drop in the, uh, in the younger localities in the last pretty much 10 million of years of Ediacaran. And after that, uh, in, uh, when we go to Paleozoic in Cambrian, it's getting uh, back. Uh, the alpha and um, gamma diversity, it's, it's uh, getting better than it was before. And then pretty much it uh, changes uh, differently. But what is interesting that um, in those last 10, of, 10 millions of years of Ediacaran period, it's also the time when uh, 
the um, Avalon and White Sea uh, Ediacaran uh, assemblages uh, were changed to the NAMA assemblage. And NAMA assemblage is the appropriate uh, assemblage of the Ediacaran biota. And uh, there are a lot of uh, talks about what was happening there. But we know that for the last 10 millions of years of Ediacaran, the amount of Ediacaran uh, biota uh, drops significantly. And also, uh, during that time, we start to see the uh, first skeletal animals. Uh, they appear pretty much in that time, in the last 10 millions of years of uh, Ediacaran. And back in time, this period of time by the Martin Brazier was referred as Catalinian crisis because he also saw that the something was happening during that time. Uh, and uh, so, at that time, also the macroalgae uh, diversity falls down, and uh, the macroalgae uh, getting uh, more simple. They only have uh, mostly ribbon and uh, tubular forms. There are some branch forms, but there are not as many, and uh, the diversity really falls down. And those ten millions of years, uh, maybe a good wrapper to uh, make the first uh, stage uh, of the diacron which right now uh, uh, the scientists work on. So as a conclusion of my talk, the, what I try to show you that uh, from the perspective of paleontologists, there is the overall increasing trajectory in the all parameters of macroalga from Proterozoic to early Paleozoic. Uh, there is uh, that increase is not continuous. We have two stepwise increases during the late Neoproterozoic, uh, during the Neoproterozoic and the Ordovician intervals. Uh, there is no Cambrian explosion of macroalgae. Uh, it's most probably happened in Neoproterozoic prior the Cam uh, prior the Cambrian explosion of animals. Uh, the diversification of macroalgae occurred. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same prior to the main episode of Cambrian explosion. And there is a possible extinction event in the last 10 millions of years prior to the Ediacaran Cambrian transition, the Catalinian crisis, or maybe there are some changes in the uh, geochemistry of the ocean, which uh, basically preserve the different signal which we see as the um, possible extinction event. And of course, with all of that, we can see that the macroalgae were becoming increasingly important in ecological theory and in carbon cycling in the coastal environments uh, from the Proterozoic to early Paleozoic. And with that, uh, that's all for the lecture. And here the acknowledgments to some people who were helping with that particular research and of course the, uh, the fund sources uh, for this uh, study. So now I'm, I'm ready to answer any questions if there are any. I do not hear you. Okay, okay. Now I do, I do listen. Okay. Yeah. Natalia, I'm busy late. Beautiful fossils. I like it a lot for presentation. Uh, I learn it a lot. Uh, I am a paleontologist, but I like macroalgae also. <laughs> so I am learning it very good. And uh, I have I have two questions here. Yes. Sir. Okay. From my part, people, okay. if anybody wants to ask, please uh, write here, and I will ask Dr. Natalia. I have two questions from my part. Natalia, okay. as I told you, my English is very good. It's not is not very good, so maybe I didn't understand some things that you said. So I would it's like okay. to ask. 
Ah, que... E o sed that branch de alga appear with animals. Branch de alga appear de, uh, together uh -huh. with animals. Is it? Uh -huh. So I would like to understand why. I think you, you gave a uh, explanation. You explained about it, but I didn't get it. Uh, what was the the reason that uh, branched macroalgas uh, mm -hmm. comes together the animals? I think I I don't know if I understand yes. too well. Yes, I I understand what you're trying to ask me. So that part with Tony and it was basically a speculation because we do not know. But we know that the branch macroalgae appears in Tonian, and based on the molecular clock analysis, uh, there is estimation that the first animals were also, well, also could appear in Tonian period. And I was just saying that, see, we, we have the branch macroalgae, and the branching was most probably the response for something. And I was just trying to find that something, and we said, look, there are estimations that the animals appear here, so maybe maybe that's causation. But it's not necessarily that. Maybe just to not connected to each other things which happen in Tonian. The reason why I was uh, looking at animals because if we look at the later uh, morphospace change, which happens in Ordovician, that one as my colleague Steve Laduca showed in his paper in 2017, very plausible that that happened, that uh, changes and the really, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Complex form, complex uh, branching in order vision is very plausible happened because of the appearance of specific type of animals which were eating them and basically by making all those branches they trying to protect themselves from not being eaten and so because that happened in our division and it's kind of everybody agrees with that if we look at tonian there are all like there are also data uh which shows that the animals may appear at that time and it may be the reason why the macroalga started to be branched, but it may be not. So we don't know for now. So that part, it's not that you didn't understand it, it was a speculation part. Okay, okay. And I have one more question. I have one more question. Do you believe, do you believe uh, that animal interfere nowadays in macroalga evolution? Do you believe that nowadays animals are interfering in macroalga evolution? You you think it or not? Well, uh, based on the ecological studies, uh, as far as I aware, uh, based on the modern ecological studies, we know that depending on the places where there are a lot of animals which are grazing. On the microalga, there are specific uh, forms of microalga which appears there. So most of the time it's branched forms uh, which appear there. And if there are no that much grazing happening, uh, the overall uh, assemblages of microalga in that area will be more uh, simple in terms of morphology. So I'm pretty sure that uh, there is still that evolution happening and they're trying to uh, the animals trying to eat and the macroalga trying to protect themselves. Um, in terms of, uh, if I can point out like specific place where see like the new macroalga period because of like that process happening, I cannot say that, but based on the like those uh, assemblage uh, level studies, it shows that we still have the same process happening. Uh, between the macroalga and the um, uh, animals in the border. Okay. Area. okay. Uh, we have some questions here, Natasha, uh, okay. from people. 
I don't know if you can see these questions in your side. Can you see the questions? Uh -huh. Or I have to... No. I, uh, I see Francisco, Francisco, Francisco is the first. Francisco Silva from Brazil is the first. Uh, he said, can you relate the increasing trajectory of macroalgae to change in sea water composition? Francisco from Brazil uh -huh. asked. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. It, it, it's a good question. Uh, the problem is that uh, probably even though the, uh, the like, uh, Redox proxies uh, for the uh, ocean composition, basically, and the uh, redox uh, changes in the ocean were established some time ago. In turn, uh, there are not so long time when they started to be applied for Precambrian. And uh, there are no that much data. Like right now, there are more and more data appearing. But uh, if we can say something for Mesopotamia, for example, uh, that mostly it was ferruginous water with not that much oxygen in it. Uh, it wasn't ex eugenia for most of the time, uh, but it was ferruginous and with not a lot of oxygen, though there are some like oxygen or as assist happening in some places. Uh, that's for Mesoproterozoic, but for example, for Tonian and Cryogenian, that we don't have that much data in terms of the ocean composition. Uh, for Ediacaran, again, it's uh, a little bit more amount of data which we have for now, uh, but again, they mostly concentrated in those last 10 million of years or so. Uh, so I would say that the chemical composition of the water uh, can, uh, most probably can affect uh, the morphology and the evolution overall, but with the uh, existing data right now, it's really hard to say, so we need to have more data. Maybe like in 20 years, 20, 30 years, <laughs> when we have more data in those particular periods of time, uh, where we have those really big jumps in uh, morphologies. Uh, when we will have more data, maybe we can say something more specific. For now, that's it pretty much. But thank you for the question, because the composition of uh, ocean, it's, uh, it's also a big part of the story. Okay, okay. Natalia, we have another question from Gina Gazadanki. Uh, okay. Uh, she asks you here, is it possible to differentiate between the real extinction of macroalgae and simple a drop in the rate of speciation? Uh, she's asking, Dima, Dima Gashidank. Okay, Dima Gashidankin, basically analysis between the real extinction of macro and the simple drop in the rate of speciation. For now, it's not, I would say, uh, because uh, there, there are, uh, uh, that's part I didn't go to, but um, one of the reasons, um, and it's explained in my paper, uh, we have a real mess in terms of systematics in Precambrian for macroalgae. Uh, for example, we have such species as Vendotania, which is really common in those 10 million, last 10 millions of years. And originally it was described uh, here in Russia, but it were really bad uh, photographs or even no photographs. And right now, some people describe it as a ribbon fossil. Some people describe it as the tubular fossil. Uh, but they call it Ventotania. And there are other cases where, like, you know, it's uh, the same thing, but it has different names depending where it was found in, like, Russia or China or Namibia. So for now, we have a real problem with systematics, so we cannot 
say uh, with the parent data if there is any changes in speciation uh, like origination because we do not have really nicely established systematics of those macroalgae. That's why we did that morphological analysis, which doesn't need to have a specific like species. We basically just look at the morphology and we do not care pretty much uh, if it's one species or two different species, because on the our data, it's either, either going to be coded as one, uh, one morphology or two different morphologies. So for now, with the current status of data, we cannot dif differentiate between the real extension event or the drops in the speculation, in the origination for that time. Okay. Uh, we, have another, uh, we have another question. Ana Beatriz Santana. How did you know that you wanted geology for your life? <laughs> oh, it's, it's a good one. I didn't know. <laughs> See? Uh, uh, before I entered the university, I think, well, my sister entered her year, like she's um, elder one, two, two years older than I am. So she first went to geology and it was the first time when I ever heard anything about geology so i haven't had that like you know i want to be a geologist from when i was in the kindergarten but to be fair i still have my child memories when we went to the uh, sea here we have the uh, artificial sea which we call sea because we in siberia we want to have sea uh, so we went we would go to the bank of the sea uh to the coast of the sea and Every single time I would return with the big bag uh, of rocks. And I, I was little, I was like four years old, maybe five years old. And I would collect all those rocks because they look pretty. Come on, like all rocks for geologists look pretty. They look pretty for me and I was always collecting them. Uh, and my mom always was saying this like, dear why do you need that i was like i don't know i just need them she's like i will not care them for you i was like i don't care i can care them myself and uh in order to get out from the sea like it's uh in the uh, like low part and of course and then you need to go uphill like pretty pr pretty long way and i was every single time i was carrying by myself like five years old was carrying that big plastic bag full of rocks uh, from the uh, coast of our sea. Maybe, maybe, maybe somehow that, that like, you know, imprinted in my mind that I, I want rocks in my life. Uh, but uh, it, it wasn't like a child dream. Like I want to be geologist. And I, I honestly didn't know what geologists do. Uh, so that was, that was just my story. I, I, I happen to be a geologist and I happen to like it. So I stick here. But thank you for the question. <laughs> Very interesting. So uh, anybody want to ask more things? I think no. No, I don't see any other questions. Yes, so I think we can finish. And uh, Natalia, please, uh, do you want to say anything more? Thank you very much for your presence here. I am really happy. My experience with the Rocha, I never talked with the Rocha, yes, when the Rocha passed. So thank you very much. Sorry for my terrible English, but I think people understand me. <laughs> oh, you okay. have a good English. Uh, I just wanted to say a real thank you for you for, for the invitation. Uh, I was really happy to uh, get it uh, out of nowhere. And the, I, I still remember how I got it. It was evening, uh, like Monday evening. And I was on my way back home and I got the message from you. And I was like, oh, my God, I, I was so happy uh, to get that message. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it was real pleasure to 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 be here uh to talk about my work and i hope that 
more people started to be interested in my crowd and uh, yeah, yeah. Some people listen in paleontology. People think only animals, only dinosaurs, mm. only mammals. But no, there mm. are algae, there are plant fossils, there are many things interesting. Exactly. Uh, yes, yes. So really, I am happy with your presence here. Uh, you are welcome to Brazil. And, I uh, <laughs> and listen, uh, after I want to talk about you, because I want to invite you uh, for all the presentations here. And uh, uh, this presentation will be recorded and I will share it here. And you can share in Russian and in another part of the world. Yeah, I, I some, in some of my webmates it right now <laughs> okay okay so people thank you very much for everybody here also people coming to 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 hear your presentation so i think is it so we can find uh you if you don't want to say anything i know that presentation yes <laughs> yes thank you Okay. So bye people. Bye bye. Bye bye bye.